we've been obviously looking at theoretical frameworks and policy frameworks, etc., during the day. But, but now is the time when we're trying to find uh, the real meat of this, and we've got four uh, very important, very distinguished businessmen who are going to be sharing this with us. I'm not going to mechanically go through uh, resumes. You have that information, and I would ask you to just to search that out as you're seeking additional context for our speakers. I am going to proceed alphabetically, and that happily gives us a chance to alternate American, Russian, and I think that'll be a, a useful way to begin. I'll ask my colleagues to think about maybe 10 minutes and you know, eight to ten minutes for your framing remarks, and then we will, I'll have a few questions myself, and then we'll open up for conversation. Sam Allen is the CEO of John Deere. Uh, John Deere is one of the iconic American companies. Uh, it traces its lineage back to 1837, I think. It's, it's uh, one of those country, companies that's kind of reinvented itself three and four times, and Sam is in the process of doing that right now. It's a remarkable company, tremendous product line. And it's had a very vigorous outreach internationally. And it's uh, wonderful that you join us today, Sam. Why don't you get us started with your conversation? We open up this. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. What I thought I would try to do is uh, quickly uh, give you some reference as to Deere's presence in Russia, what all we are or doing there. Uh, then I'd like to pull back and tell you why we are so optimistic on Russia and why we are so committed to doing this. And then I'll end a little bit with Deere is strongly, strongly supportive of Russia's ascension into the WTO and uh, PNTR. And so why that's important to us and important, I think, to any uh, US global company. Uh, you mentioned that we've been around 174 years. What I think is important to that it is literally, in our records, the first products we sold to Russia were in 1911, 100 years ago. So we have been doing business with Russia for a long, long time. If we fast forward here to this uh, last uh, decade a period of time, in three of our major product lines, ag agricultural equipment where we're number one in the world, uh, forestry equipment where we're number one in the world, and construction equipment where we're a significant player, all three of those now we have localized to some degree manufacturing in Russia. Uh, our first operation we put in place in 2005, uh, that's down in Orenburg, which makes seeding or planting equipment. Uh, we were not doing anything through 2008. We're one of the ones that earlier today people said as a result of the financial crisis there was a debate on whether Russia did increase import duties or not. Uh, we can tell you yes, we did, because we're one of the ones that saw the major increases in import duties and elimination of uh, retail financing in the marketplace as a result of not being a Russian maid. We announced uh, we were a part of the, the uh, economic summit in, in June, and, and the, there in 2009, we announced that we were ready to commit up to $500 million investing in Russia to make Russian-made manufacturing a, a product. Uh, in May of last year, we in fact then uh, started the Domodedovo operations, both a parts distribution and manufacturing center and I was with the uh, Biden meetings here just three weeks ago where we announced we were doubling the size of that operation as well as also putting in retail financing by the end of, of the year. So we are putting a significant amount of investment. Roughly we have between ourselves and our distribution tw channel 2,200 employees right now in Russia and committed to going forward. Why and why should everybody, uh, especially in this space that we are blessed to play in, be concerned about that? And it has to do with feeding the world. Between now and 2050, the world is going to have to double food output. That's not debatable. We all agree that has to happen. You're seeing some of that issue play out right now today. Russia has 9% of the world's arable land mass. It has 8% of the world's fresh water. Most of this land that is arable is either underutilized or not utilized today. Significant, significant opportunities become a major breadbasket. In fact, we would argue that we're not going to feed the world in 2050 without Russia becoming an economic uh, agricultural powerhouse. And as a result, we have committed strategically over the long term to be a part of that. Likewise, Russia is blessed with 20% of the world's forest reserves. It is also has an opportunity to contribute uh, significantly in that area. So agriculture is both about increasing output, increasing output in a sustainable fashion. And in both of those cases, Russia is a critical 
enabler of that because they do have 8% of the world's fresh water, so they're able to do it in a sustainable fashion. Um, so our, our investments that we have made were with that in mind with a very long-term focus. As we've gone in in a more significant way, like others, and as we've talked about it, we've had, uh, I would call it, two steps forward and one step back. On a positive note, when we announced the Domo Dedovo uh, expansion, or the initial uh, production there, we literally, from seven months from approval of that project, we were in, in the building and manufacturing product, which I would argue is world class anywhere in the world. And a lot of people think that can't happen in Russia. And at the local level, when everyone is aligned, uh, a lot of things can happen very, very quickly. And that's been a very, very much of a positive. Our view on the move towards WTO is very much it just solidifies the foundational elements. It, it assures more that you have security over intellectual property. It assures more that you create a uh, financial system in place that allows for access to financing. In fact, during the downturn, the absolute number one issue we had is there were no credible financing solutions in the marketplace, which is why we're coming in. But if they were in the WTO and other uh, banking in industries felt more comfortable coming in, we know that access to that uh, credit by our customers would be more prevalent, and that would be a great opportunity. And then when we do have an issue like localization and getting agreement on what localization, localization should be, we have the forum, we have the venue in order to argue that out, and, and we think that would be just positive from a long-term investment standpoint. Overall, we're very bullish. We think WTO is a, is a much, is a very much of a plus, and it's, uh, in our case, it's good for American jobs because of a lot of the products, uh, major components in some of these products come from our U.S. factories. It's good for the world in terms of feeding the world, the world as well. Thanks, Jeff. Sam, thank you. Uh, let me turn now to Vladimir Dimitrov. Um, Vladimir is, uh, is a banker in his, in his own right, of course, but uh, currently he is serving as the chairman and CEO of the Bank for Development and Foreign Economic Affairs, Vinesh Ekonombank. Uh, he has, however, had a history in commercial banking and, uh, and, of course, the unique perspective that bankers have, this broad synoptic view of an economy. And we would ask you to share a bit of that with us today, Dimitri. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start with uh, some words about our bank, uh, which is one of the oldest financial institutions in Russia, uh, set up in 1924. And uh, since that time, uh, we were the only financial institution, the only bank uh, authorized to service foreign economic transactions, which means that uh, all uh, foreign investments which came to the Soviet Union from that time were supervised and serviced by Nesha Kanam Bank. Major plants, factories like Kamas, like Fiat, like uh, those uh, which were supported by uh, uh, American capital were uh, supported by VEB. And uh, by uh, 2007, uh, we were still uh, the only institution within this uh, um, former Soviet Union uh, territory <coughs> which was called, uh, which preserved the name of the USSR. We were called uh, the Bank of Foreign Economic Affairs of the USSR. Uh, since um, uh, we, um, by that time, uh, where the institution which was in charge as an agent for the government in charge of <clears throat> serving, uh, serving um, external debt and financial assets of the Russian Federation. But 2007, um, because of natural and quite logical um, circumstances, we uh, became the Bank for Development and Foreign Economic Affairs uh, by law, uh, which was specifically designed for uh, Venetian Economic Bank, we uh, are authorized uh, to, uh, first of all, uh, to support uh, transition to a new economy to overcome uh, infrastructure restrictions of economic growth, which means that infrastructure is one of the core directions of our uh, activity. Uh, we finance major projects in core industries 
uh, primarily those uh, which generate uh, goods and products with higher added value and those industries which are in line with the um, uh, priorities of economic policy of our government. Uh, modernization, innovation, uh, energy saving, um, space and telecommunication industry, uh, supercomputers, uh, and some others. Um, another priority of our activity is small and medium enterprises. Uh, we are keen to support Russian industrial export and Russian investments abroad. And of course, uh, attraction of foreign investments is another priority of our activity. Um, those major uh, directions of our um, banking activity um, we consider uh, as a part of the global policy <clears throat> of our government to attract foreign investments. Because uh, none of those uh, directions may be uh, well developed without uh, uh, best expertise from abroad, without money coming from abroad, and uh, uh, not only best expertise, uh, best uh, uh, management, but uh, transparency, uh, policy which uh, should be understandable for foreign investors. Uh, that sort of uh, environment we want to create in our country. Uh, of course, being the institution 100% owned by the state and by law the chairman of our supervisory board is the prime minister, we um, um, run our policy in very much connection uh, with the uh, core direction of, directions of economic development of our country. Uh, and with this regard, I would like to inform you about several um, uh, decisions which were uh, taken in order to attract foreign investors and to create an um, investment climate which is um, very uh, friendly for investors from, uh, by the way, from USA and from the worldwide. Um, two years ago, uh, our bank jointly with IFC, uh, EBRD, uh, Macquarie, uh, banking group uh, and some other institutions uh, set up an um, infrastructure fund in the range of uh, one billion dollars. Now uh, we uh, uh, have this fund uh, with a volume of 650 million uh, dollars uh, dedicated to finance major infrastructure projects in Russia. The first deal was uh, closed in the end of last year uh, and exactly after our involvement in the uh, equity of one of the major infrastructure company, um, two more private equity funds stepped in, which means that um, by showing our um, engagement in uh, uh, financing uh, such projects, we attract foreign investments uh, and uh, they see our presence, presence as a sort of guarantee and co-sharing risks uh, with them. Um, a year ago, uh, the President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Medvedev, announced uh, the necessity of uh, improving um, investment climate by setting up a special um, uh, direct uh, investment fund uh, which uh, should be funded from the budget. Uh, clearly, uh, infrastructure development is a critical enabler on two levels for us. One, it's one of the great inhibitors from having cost-effective agriculture throughout all of Russia. Uh, it's just they, they can grow the grains, they just can't get it to the port very cost-effectively. So uh, that's a critical enabler from that standpoint. As far as where we're located, um, you know, our plant's in Domodedovo, right next to the, the major airport, and it's there for one reason. <laughs> and it's because it's a lot easier to get around the country uh, when you're real close to a major airport. And uh, so it is a big issue. Um, the good news is, compared to some of these, this is one that uh, can be solved with uh, continued investment in, in infrastructure development. And Vladimir, let me ask, if I may, you, you made a case that 
that you know you're you're in the business of providing an attractive uh, investment destination for the world. You're looking for capital to be brought in around the world, and of course, a lot of that is to deal with these underlying factors to make the you know the, the transactional barriers of doing business lower. But also, businessmen are looking for internal growth opportunities. Now, part of it is you know because they're natural resources and things, etc. But also, they're looking for the health and vitality and the growth opportunities of a market. And how do you look at that? I mean, Russia right now has a rel relatively static uh, population base. How do you think about it? how are you projecting the future for Russia as a as an attractive investment uh, destination for international capital? I think a um, uh, majority of those who uh, uh, have been talking today uh, touched upon major uh, issues uh, which should be addressed uh, with this regard. Um, uh, this task is uh, multiple and uh, it's not just uh, to uh, uh, fight corruption, uh, to lift administrative barriers, uh, but uh, investment env environment, it is uh, uh, healthcare, not only in Moscow, but in Saratov, in Vladivostok, well, sir, uh, elsewhere, uh, where we would like to see foreign investors, uh, and they would like to see uh, comfort and appropriate uh, social environment, and not only uh, breaking uh, local uh, bureaucracy and uh, uh, fighting uh, um, monopolists and other tycoons. <clears throat> I think uh, all these issues are well addressed by the government, and step by step we are trying to uh, improve it. Uh, with setting up special institutions, Dennis mentioned uh, free economic zones, um, uh, concessions, uh, public-private partnership, which is set up in our country, uh, a special governmental uh, bodies, which are set up like uh, uh, institutions for development. And we are not the only one, by the way. Uh, uh, Russian nanotechnologies, uh, Russian venture uh, company, uh, others who are working with uh, uh, venture capital, innovative uh, industries, small and medium enterprises. Uh, of course, we're well behind uh, not only uh, well-developed countries, but uh, BRICS countries uh, with many regards. Uh, for instance, uh, in China, 80% of population um, live within uh, uh, two hours uh, access to the nearest airport, which allows this huge country and this huge population with more than a billion uh, citizens uh, to be mobile, uh, to move around the country and to use their abilities, uh, abilities not only in their local cities but uh, around the country, which of course is not the case for us. Uh, during Soviet Union time, we had, if I'm not mistaken, 300 airports. Now we have roughly 80 airports which are well equipped uh, to receive um, uh, airplanes. Of course, infrastructure is another obstacle for uh, invest investors to come. But again, uh, all these issues are well addressed by, by the government. And step by step, we're trying, we trying to improve and to upgrade uh, the level of uh, investment uh, climate in Russia. Anders. Thank you. Let me pose uh, two different uh, questions. One of the arguments uh, made about the uh, WTO um, accession uh, for Russia from the US point of view is that there will be more foreign direct investment there and less export. And, I heard you making the point uh, in your presentation 
Mr. Ambat, you said that uh, you will increase your uh, exports to Russia because of the parts that you are taking there. I know it's the same with Caterpillar, Ford, and uh, General Motors. So it would be quite interesting to, if you could give us some proportions on how much this uh, actually means uh, for the trade. And then either for Vladimir or uh, Dennis, I would like to ask about the, Rush, uh, the attitude of the Russian business community now in the, with regard to the WTO. Traditionally, the Russian uh, business community has been in favor of WTO with a few exceptions. Which are these exceptions today and how strong are they? Because uh, since the discussion has uh, lasted for so long, the business uh, community quite naturally has gone rather uh, quiet. Are the strong feelings within the a business community in Russia today for or against WTO, and how are the, the fronts uh, uh, today? Thank you. Now for a company like ours, a lot of our products are very, very large, and uh, the cost to ship, uh, it, it, it's very prohibitive unless the market is very, very small. It just so happens in the areas that we're talking about, the Russian market's a very good-sized market. so. Uh, you know, it would take uh, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to ship a combine here, for example. It makes a lot of sense to do a level of the manufacturing here. At the same time, though, there's a lot of uh, very high value added components like engines, axles, powertrains, where the capital investments are very, very significant. And once you have those in play, you keep them. So um, we're localizing a uh, combine, for example, in Domodedovo, but the engine is still going to come out of our factory in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, for a long time, the head manufacturing will still come out of our, our head, or out of our factory in East Moline, uh, uh, Illinois. So I think it's, it's, you know, if you allow business forces, if you allow economics to, to rule, you will get a level of localization that is scalable, but at the same time, um, you will also get a benefit to the home country where, again, from a cost-effective standpoint, it makes more sense to keep it there. And the argument that I would give to others is that to the degree that you don't have a, a WTO, um, then we're going to be precluded from being in that market whatsoever. So we're never going to sell the engine, we're never going to sell, sell the head if we're precluded from being in the market. You're much better off uh, having it go both ways. And, I think in a lot, a lot of our components, that's the case. It may not be so if you're shipping pens or something like that. They're very small, but in any of the major uh, uh, significant pieces of equipment, I, I think uh, the, the economics are the same for everyone. Um, WTO. <clears throat> uh, business community in Russia is uh, divided with this regard. There are those uh, who are not afraid of uh, opening borders, um, being already prepared uh, for competition with foreign companies. But there are those uh, who, want, who still want, uh, because of their uh, position uh, uh, and less competitiveness towards vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, foreign um, uh, goods and uh, uh, products, they still want to use benefits of not being with your member uh, to uh, not to remove barriers uh, before uh, foreign goods and, 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 and products. Uh, this is a case uh, with uh, uh, heavy lorry reproduction uh, production in Russia with some other uh, machineries, uh, energy uh, machinery and energy equipment and some others. Uh, perhaps you remember last Saturday uh, when uh, the um, uh, conference took place in St. Petersburg on uh, energy machinery, uh, a clear signal was sent to the uh, uh, to Russian industrialists and uh, to abroad that since we are not the member uh, of WTO, and uh, we do not know yet where uh, we will be uh, a member of the organization, uh, but uh, 
uh, taking into consideration that Russia sacrificed very much already uh, as if we are a member country of WTO, we should still be careful in uh, giving up positions. Uh, since we are not the member, uh, we should take benefits of this and to support uh, particular um, industries in Russia which are, not, which, are not, which are still not that competitive uh, against or vis-a-vis -vis, um, foreign production. That's, uh, that's my view on the opinion of Russian business community on WTO membership. Dennis, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Mr. Dmitriev because there are different approaches and in general Russian companies don't like competition because they don't get used to competition, right? And uh, changing environment like external environment that will put additional pressure on the Russian companies is not really welcomed by everyone. But I would say that potential Russian accession to the WTO and potential uh, improvement competitiveness also pretty well coincided with uh, what is President Medvedev is uh, saying today and Prime Minister Putin about innovation, modernization, uh, diversification of the Russian economy and uh, it should be made really clear to the Russian business community this, this is inevitable because everyone is saying that it's the only way to go and uh, basically WTO will uh, provide uh, maybe additional frame framework in order to achieving these goals actually. And also Russian companies shouldn't really afraid uh, from uh, Russia joining WTO because as I understand, I'm not a big expert in this area, but I understand that we'll have like kind of seven years uh, period of time uh, during which we will have like basically to adopt and to comply completely with WTO regulations. So it will not be like overnight event, one hook event that actually tomorrow you wake up and you wake up in different world. It will take some time to adopt and it pretty well coincides with uh, what the Russian government is uh, wanting to do today, right? I think, if truth be known, probably Americans don't like competition either. But the reality is, is that we know that it tends to make us healthier. You know, if you if you're not used to exercising, you can't climb steps without getting winded. But if you've got a lot of competition, you you're better for it. And it's painful. It's hard. And we but we know that. Uh, let me ask one question uh, of you, Clay, before I open up to the floor. Which it, and this is a hard fastball right over the plate. So, uh, you know. Russia has two great resources, natural resources. Of course, it's bounty that the good Lord gave them, you know, with uh, oil and gas and minerals and forests, etc. But they also gave them this they have this remarkable human talent in science and engineering, and uh, an education system that has produced fabulous engineers and fabulous scientific talent. But the American security establishment has a paranoia about letting American companies work with foreign talent, especially previous competitors. What is this doing to you? How are you confronting this problem with American security paranoia? Is it affecting you? And is there something that we ought to be doing about that? Um, it's, it's not affecting us now. That doesn't mean that it won't. Um, I think that um, the, the paranoia, and some of it's well placed, uh, paranoia is, um, affects us on things like export control issues. Right. Um, it affects us, by the way, on the Russian side with um, having certain encryption in technology in every product that we put, bring into the country, which creates, makes the trade very difficult. Um, but um, in terms of, I think, working with, I think that is what we see as the opportunity in Russia, is, is just what you just said. There's a amazing amount of talent uh, <laughs> from Russians on, on technical skills, something that sometimes we don't have probably maybe as much in the United States as we should, or at least on a per capita basis. And, um, but some of that talent, <coughs> the way we see it, is that uh, is not getting through in the, from a business perspective. Um, I did have a statistic that I didn't read, but I, let me read it now. Um, only about 50% of Russian companies invest in uh, research and development to create innovative products. But maybe a little bit more importantly, only 3% of Russian companies successfully invest in the development of innovative products that compete in the global marketplace. 3%. Uh, 
Um, that means, in some respects, you have this, all this talent, and they're not able to take that talent and go to the next level, which is how do you take an interesting, really good idea and make it a business idea where you can then market it. And that's something that we believe that, that we can assist on that area, and that will help Cisco's business and Cisco's shareholders in the long run. Andy Cutchins? Thanks. Uh, really interesting discussion. One of the, the, the topics or concerns, concerns that came up this morning was the increasing sense of a uh, rentier mentality amongst uh, younger generations of, of Russians. And that increasingly, it's more popular for a, a Russian to, to think about becoming a gosudarstvenny uh, chinovnik, a bureaucrat, rather than going into business. Now, uh, I'd be curious, especially uh, from uh, Vladimir and. and uh, and Denise, and Denise, it was about 15 years ago or so, sometime in the 1990s, you made the decision to go into business and, and the, into, the, into the private sector. Do you, guys, do you guys also agree with this assessment that this is a problem? And might you have made a different decision if you were looking at the environment today about what, what to do in the future? And if this is a problem, how do you think you should go about uh, addressing it? Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, Mr. Skrysensky, today started his presentation with like a, a story from his childhood when he was bringing ace from his school and uh, his dad was not really uh, happy about it because like it was normal, right? So I went to the uh, sport boarding school in Izmailova, so that's why my parents were not really concerned about me bringing ace to bees, but like bringing all my teeth back home, right? <laughs> so, that's why I decided to go to business probably, and uh, that's why maybe Mr. Skrysinski ended up working for the Russian government. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, speaking seriously, uh, so we, we, we really saw, especially during the last decade, a uh, big interference of the state uh, in the Russian economy. Uh, and uh, definitely it's more prestigious today for the younger generation to work for the state-owned companies or to work for the presidential administration or for the Russian government because um, maybe it just make life easier, I don't know. So, and uh, this is a really big concern from my personal point of view because I also have children and I want them to do something right and good for my country and uh, uh, I really want them to create something instead of like trying to um, uh, use some opportunities that are being provided by certain positions that you may have working for the government or in the uh, public sector. But uh, having said that, that, we should like uh, create a real environment for competition and people who are not uh, afraid of taking risks and uh, of making failures <coughs> but also how very well regarded in order they achieve some results. So it should be also kind of a, like public policy in the Russian Federation in order to stimulate people to do something and achieve something. Uh, I read somewhere that the same question was asked in China where the vast majority of young population want to do business because it's prestigious, it's cool, and it's very well uh, rewarded. So in Russia, unfortunately, it's not the case today, and definitely we have to change it. Can I ask you just to come on over to the microphone, and we'll, we'll be glad to have your question. May I add something? Oh, for, oh so, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive me. For, for Vladimir, you go yes. ahead, and we'll be right back. Yes. I, uh, I agree with Dennis. I agree with the uh, conclusion that uh, there is a problem uh, in Russia um, about preferences in uh, um, uh, uh, in working with the uh, with the government, being civil servants uh, rather than um, entrepreneurs, um, but I think um, that um, we have to ha uh, to take into consideration um, a very difficult period of uh, a dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the problems we had. Uh, when we actually lost a generation, we did not support, we just uh, put people uh, who, don't, uh, who don't swim, we just uh, threw them into the river. Those who uh, managed to survive, they reached uh, the beach. 
but others, they just uh, drunk into these unclear, uh, unclear waters. And uh, of course, when the state uh, cannot support, uh, cannot uh, 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 secure uh, this de generation, uh, people are rather inclined to uh, be civil servants as the most uh, secure atmosphere and environment rather than uh, uh, be a part of competitive uh, environment. But uh, this is one of the most important tasks right, right now for the government, to create this atmosphere and to support atmosphere of competitiveness. Uh, and not to punish those uh, who, uh, who do not succeed. Uh, do you know what, what we're now considering while, uh, and Sergei is a part of, this, uh, uh, of these talks, uh, we are now considering how to avoid punishment of those entrepreneurs in uh, Skolkova, in uh, venture company, companies, uh, who are supported by budgetary money but uh, do not succeed or uh, are not su successive or uh, make faults and lose money. Uh, in uh, um, innovative uh, venture business, there is 10% success probably, but it may be a fortune. But uh, when you are threatened that uh, counting chamber or Chief Persecutor's uh, uh, Service uh, will come and say, look, you lose money, you lose budgetary money, you should be jailed. That's the problem. And we have to, uh, 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 we have to create that sort of atmosphere that people are not afraid of making mistakes, which is one of the problems. But of course, uh, other institutions which are set up to support competitiveness, uh, to support entrepreneur-like atmosphere and mentality. Uh, this is uh, a very important task, which, as I've already mentioned, is addressed by the government. And uh, we are doing a lot of things uh, to support that sort of uh, environment and mentality in, in, in our country. Yes, ma'am, and then... Yeah, maybe I also want to add that 18 years ago, uh, young people wanted to become bandits. This is what's called. <laughs> Today they want to work in the public sector, and maybe this is not such a bad development, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, please. And then academician, thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Allen. Um, with re regards to um, localization of production and um, leveling the playing field, um, I know that Russian government has set up a special leasing program through the state bank, the Rosegr leasing, uh, for farm equipment whereby um, the Russian equipment made in Russia is subsidized um, while the foreign equipment is not. It used to be that the foreign equipment wasn't, you weren't even able to purchase it, purchase it through the program. Um, could you please address how much it has affected your business in Russia and where you see this policy going? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you, you are correct, and it, it, it has, uh, I think the combination of that and the financial crisis both, what we have said is uh, our, our business from the uh, end of 08 to the middle of 09 went down by over 80 percent. And uh, you can debate how much of that was because no longer having the access to the, the, uh, the financing and how much of it was as a result of import duties uh, if it was not made in Russia. Today, we do qualify for Made in Russia, but we don't yet qualify for uh, the financing. Um, and so our business is still off. Um, what we've been doing and what we continue to do is move forward both uh, from a front, on one front, trying to, uh, wherever possible, get people to understand that that might work in the near term, but it's really uh, an impediment for long-term progress of agriculture in Russia because you need the most for Russian farmers to, to compete, they got to be globally competitive, and you can't be globally competitive if the, the product that you're using doesn't enable you to cost-effectively raise the crop. And so we think it's, it's a near-term uh, maybe win, but a long-term negative for Russian farmers.
but at the same time, we're moving and, and in dialogue with the Russian government on how can we come up with a set of rules that allows us to cost effectively localize. And uh, the issue is not about localizing, but how much do we have to localize and can we keep it cost effective? And um, we're in the middle of those negotiations now, have been for the last year with all, all the equipment manufacturers are doing it with them and uh, hopefully we'll see something come out here in the next few months. Uh, Alexander Dinkin. I have a question to Mr. Lowery. Uh, I was very much impressed by your numbers. Uh, you said that you received something like 12,000 ideas, right? From several thousand scholars or researchers, whatever. And you are going to pay them something like $360,000, right? Uh, it's very good business, I guess. Is the salary of the senior vice president for, let's say, <laughs> some brilliant ideas. And this is concept of the open source innovation. So everybody behave this way. My question is, uh, did your company make any decisions about capital expenditures in Skolkovo? Um, we have said that we will, but uh, we have not at this moment um, made a, any um, decisions. We're part of the Skolkovo board and um, we are going to eventually put something in Skokovo. That's part of our plan, but we've not made a specific uh, numeric uh, decision at this point. Thank you. So what's $1 billion number is what? $1 billion is a multi-year multi, multi -year number, um, and it's going to be a variety of different types of investments. Vlad? Thanks to your panel. Uh, well, Andy, I'm Russian and I'm in the business school now. I'm from Brenda's International Business School, so I guess I'm not looking for easy life. So my question is, uh, the Moscow is a, uh, is a global financial center. It's been on the agenda about a year ago. Uh, wh where is it now? Is this item on the agenda now? Do you think it's ever going to happen? And what does it mean for companies? And is the United States going to help or can help with this? Thank you. I'm willing to start on this one. Um, uh, less from my Cisco background, more from my previous background. Um, there's a, a, number of con a number of cities want to be global financial centers. Um, I think that there are a number of steps that they need to think about. Um, first of all, it's one, uh, and I probably mentioned some of them. One, do you have, um, uh, you know, for, from a Cisco perspective, do you have good IT technology? Uh, two, do you have, so do you have good uh, capital infrastructure in order to make it a financial center. Good human capital. Um, do you have, are, can you have trading of a number of financial products? Is there liquidity? Um, there's a number of cities that have looked into this. The, the city of Mumbai in India actually commissioned a fairly significant study on this very issue. Um, but if you look around, there's many cities that are trying to do this. For instance, Istanbul in Turkey is looking at doing something. How can they become a global financial center? Dubai obviously has already done a lot of work on this um, over the last few, few years. Um, and so I think the question is, is how do you become you know, London or New York or, even, or Frankfurt or Singapore and those are the, or, or Hong Kong? Um, those are like the top limits, but can you at least make, make steps towards becoming like a regional financial center and then before you become an international financial center? But I think that there are a number of areas that all countries, if they want to do this, need to improve on. Russia has a significant number of steps and, and they have put together obviously a, a, a really smart group of people to try to think through this. If I remember, I think I saw Lloyd Blankfein came out and said, you know, the biggest problem is the problem we just heard about, which is infrastructure. Uh, I think we've got... Just a Go ahead, um, please, Francis. Yes. Um, our bank is a part of the team uh, uh, who works uh, on the um, uh, setting uh, international financial center in Russia. I completely agree uh, with the point that, uh, well, uh, we should do very much in all respects uh, to be uh, an international financial center. But uh, uh, the current goal is uh, to become 
uh, at least a regional uh, financial center for CIS countries. We're not talking about uh, competing with uh, uh, New York, London, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, apart from those uh, obvious things which should be addressed and uh, well uh, um, um, uh, and resolved, like infrastructure, like uh, social life, like uh, uh, medical care, like traffic jam uh, in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> you will be prop, you know, uh, in uh, three uh, years' time, and you can't move at all uh, in Moscow. What sort of financial center should we create? If we uh, are we creating, if we uh, in that in, in that position? Uh, so step by step, we have to improve all these sorts of uh, env environment, um, and of course, inflation, uh, currency, uh, transparency, and so on and so forth. But since we are a part of, of the team, uh, I cannot work uh, on this idea without belief that uh, we, we succeed. <laughs> sure. Dennis, did you want to comment here and then I'll come one last? Yeah, I just here. absolutely agree with Mr. Dmitriev that uh, and we are not talking about Russia becoming global uh, financial center, we're talking about international financial center. Definitely Russia has very good uh, possibility to become financial center for CS country. Also, uh, taking into consideration uh, what we have heard this morning, like floating ruble, inflation targeting, why don't like other countries uh, will start pegging ruble, for example, in case they have some concerns towards some other currencies and situation when they have more similar economies and more uh, common interests with Russia than with other countries. So absolutely agree with that. Last um, um, mine is a comment as well. We are, uh, as a school and also individual, we are part of this effort. There is a consolidated effort where um, uh, all these issues that Clay and Vladimir were talking about are set up. Uh, there are working groups set up to improve education, education, healthcare, traffic infrastructure, financial infrastructure, the legal environment, regulation. And there is a process which is going to be long. Uh, but the only way is actually up, right? Because most of the international financial center is something like 50 in the world. So I think uh, improvements will be there. Uh, the, on the, on the uh, incentive side, uh, the new Moscow mayor met with the President Medvedev and they agreed that um, there'll be uh, the KPIs for Moscow city government will include development of international financial center, including traffic infrastructure education for expats, uh, health care for expats, all kinds of issues that are so important for, for development of international financial center. Coming back to human capital, there is also an effort to develop financial education, so there will be labor force for, for, um, uh, for international financial institutions. And in that sense, I, I, I'm sure Russia will not catch up with Dubai or Mumbai in three years' time, but over 10 years we'll see a great, great progress, because indeed there is a team of people who have uh, incentives, who have a plan. And in that sense, I would be rather optimistic on that side. Thank you. No, I always uh, judge the success of events by how much I learn. I, I learn a lot more than you guys do, because you're all experts. But I've learned a lot this afternoon, and we want to say thank you. Would you please join me with your applause to say thank you?